expecting a large audience today and it's going to take them a couple of minutes to get settled into the room. So I'll be making a couple of uh, opening announcements as you get settled. So Melissa, if it's, if it's a good time, let's go ahead and get started with our slides. Okay, you are in the right place if you are expecting the event on demystifying the French. Our next slide, please, Melissa. We wanna let you know about some other events that are coming up soon that might be of interest to you. We have two events coming up here in February that are gonna be in very fluent French. And uh, so if you wanna exercise your listening comprehension, you're welcome to tune into those. Um, we also have an event for um, cooks who want to learn how to make French uh, macaron. And that event is in English and that's with Chef Alain Le Notre. Um, so be sure to tune in for that event as well on Zoom. All of these are on Zoom. Then later in the month, we'll be looking into the art of translation. <clears throat> we'll be talking with Cara Black, who is a wonderful, wonderful author and a, a favorite author that we visit with quite often. And then in May, we'll turn to a topic that I knew absolutely nothing about, and I'm looking forward to it. It's about how French women convicts populated much of the Gulf Coast of the United States. So you can visit your local Alliance Francaise, uh, Alliance Francaise chapter or AFUSA.org to find out more about all of these and other events. Next slide, Melissa. Speaking of the Alliance Francaise, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later in the, in the, in the panel discussion, but obviously, you know, the more French you know, the deeper you can go in your cultural understanding. So um, we want to tell you just a little bit about the Alliance Francaise because we hope that the Alliance Francaise will be your partner in your uh, mastery of the French language. Um, some of you are already, already Alliance members, but we know that some of you are not. So here's a very brief pitch about the Alliance Francaise. In the United States, we are the largest Alliance Francaise network in the world with 100 chapters coast to coast serving about a million instruction hours per year to 25,000 students at all levels. So feel free to join us. We'd love to accompany you on your journey of learning French. Next slide, Melissa. Now for today's logistics and format, we're gonna want everybody to stay on mute. <laughs> we, went through, we went through that at the beginning. Um, do stay on your speaker view because you're gonna be, wanna watch, uh, be wanting to watch the individual panelists as they speak. And then if there are technical issues, uh, just sign back on to the link again, um, uh, to the original Zoom link. And then this event is being recorded for our YouTube channel. Our total runtime today is gonna be a little bit longer than we usually do. We we're figuring an hour and 15 minutes, maybe a teeny bit more. So our next slide, uh, speaking of YouTube, we want to remind you that we have something like 50 recorded presentations on YouTube. And some of you, when you signed up for today's presentation, you said, oh, I'd like to know about visas and health insurance in France. We're not gonna be speaking to those specific topics today. We're gonna to be speaking more about cultural differences, but we do highly recommend that you visit a presentation that we were recorded just a couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago. And that was the fourth one in from the left with Adrian Leeds. And also, if you missed part one of this cultural differences presentation, you can also find that on our YouTube channel. Next slide, Melissa. Thank you. Now to today's schedule, which you've all been waiting for. Each of the four panelists will weigh in on four very different overarching questions. And then after that, they'll be giving their views on essential questions, as well as ones that you, in the audience, you submitted with your registration forms. We will then wrap up because everyone has a very strong positive or negative opinion on Emily in Paris. We'll wrap up with a discussion on Emily in Paris. One, one teeny reminder, we will be talking in terms of cliches and generalizations about both cultures, but we're doing that for a good reason, and that is to arrive at a better understanding of the norms and expectations that are in place um, for the two cultures. So next slide, please. It's my great, great pleasure now to introduce our panelists, our four panelists, starting with Janet Holstrand, who is originally from Minnesota and who now splits her time between mainly France in the Champagne region and uh, the United States. 
She is the author of Demystifying the French, and it's no coincidence that uh, that's the name of our session today because she is the mastermind behind today's event. She is a contributing writer to Bonjour Paris and many other publications that all of you Francophiles will be very familiar with. And she teaches also for two East Coast-based institutions in the United States. Our second panelist is Harriet Welty Rochefort. Her most recent book is a fiction, Final Transgres Transgression. Prior to that, she had three books on French American cultural differences on this theme that we're talking about today. Um, she, like, like Janet, is also a former, is a teacher, uh, formerly at Fissions Po Paris, and also a retired uh, freelance journalist for many publications that I'm sure you're all familiar, familiar with. Um, Harriet has the unique distinction today to have the qualifications of having been married to a Frenchman for 50 years and has raised her family in France, which makes her, well, unique. <laughs> okay, and our next um, panelists are Adrian Leeds, who has lived in France for nearly 28 years. We need to update, update that slide. Uh, many of you know her from uh, as the top agent on House Hunters International, and she runs the Adrian Leeds Group, which of course the Alliance Française is very happy to recommend for anybody looking to buy property or rent property in France. And then finally, Mark Greenside is the author of I'll Never Be French No Matter What I Do, and I think a lot of us probably feel that way, <laughs> and not quite mastering the art of French living. Mark is originally from New York. Um, but he currently resides uh, mostly in Northern California, but he splits his time also with his home in Brittany. So welcome to all of our panelists. And merci, Melissa, you can drop our slide presentation. And now I'd like to go ahead and get going with our uh, individual questions for the panelists. And the first panelist is a question for Adrian. Welcome, Adrian. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, everyone. It's really, it's really a pleasure to be here. From and I'm in Los Angeles at the moment. But most, yeah. But but Adrian, mostly you you spend your time in either Nice or or Paris, right? Absolutely, full time, hundred percent. Well, great. Okay, so the question that you get, your dedicated question to kick off uh, our discussion today is you spend, Adrian, a lot of your time advising Americans who are coming to, to live in France about, you know, a host of practical matters, which we've already alluded to. What, however, is your best overall advice about how to get along smoothly in France, how to get along with the French? Well, you know, Linda, that really starts with what everyone is doing right this minute. And that means studying up on the cultural differences, reading all of these fabulous books that these wonderful authors have written, taking webinars such as this, uh, boning up on the real cultural differences between us so that, you know, you can uh, integrate more easily and understand exactly why you're coming up against these clashes. Um, I have spoken many times about the difference between Napoleonic code and English law. And for me, this is the fundamental difference between our cultures, that English law, which is what the US is uh, based on, has to do with, uh, it was based on, um, boy, I just, I just spaced out on this. It's based on what is uh, forbidden rather than allowed. Napoleonic code is based on what's allowed. So when you take these two ideas, it's, they are diametrically opposed on how they view life and law. And I think this is one significant thing that we all need to understand. Um, the other thing is, of course, this is my perspective. I think you need to replace the word expectations with hopes. I think if you can do that in your life and change the idea of having an expectation, which only leads to disappointments and turn that into a hope, then you're never going to be disappointed and you're going to experience all sorts of new and different things, but see them for what they are and not for what you expect them to be. Um, I also think it's really important to take professional advice uh, just to get help and professional advice on everything because we just can't understand and know everything ourselves. Uh, I also think it's important to learn how to live in the present. And this comes from Eckhart Tolle's theory of the power of now to understand that we, you know, our lives exist in this present moment 
and that everything in the past is something we can't change. It's done. It's finished. It's over with. We can't live in that. And we can't live in the future because that never exists. You know, it's only in our heads, the future. So people who are moving over to France, they have they set up all these fears about what's going to happen in their future when really what they need to do is live in the present and take each day as it comes and deal with it as it happens. And so these are just some of the things that I talk to my clients about in order to make the transition smoother. But going back to Napoleonic Code versus English law, um, you know, we learn how to see what we're not supposed to do, steal, kill, whatever, and then everything else is possible. So we think in a very open-minded way out, out of the proverbial box, whereas the French with Napoleonic Code have to follow the rules. They have to actually live by those rules that are, that are set down for them, and they can't think outside of that proverbial box. And honestly, if we can get a he our head around that, we can maneuver just about any cultural clash we end up with. That's great. Thank you so much, Adrian. A lot of deep uh, philosophy there for us to reflect on. Definitely. Our next question is for Mark. Uh, Mark, welcome to the program. Mark, can, can you take yourself off mute? You, you need to take yourself off mute now. Hi, thanks. So sure. it's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to see everybody on, on, on the screen. Um, oh. Great. Okay. Let, let me go ahead and mark. Uh, if it's okay, I'll 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 feed you your your question. Okay. It's, it's been said that the French concept of friendship is a bit different than the American concept of friendship. In your experience, uh, is that true? And and, and if so, uh, how is it different? Yeah, I think it is true, and I, I've got uh, a list of several things that I think uh, comprise the differences. I think the most important thing to to recognize is that. Um, uh, there's a difference in the basic social unit. The basic social unit in the, in the United States in America is the individual. And the basic social unit in France is the family. And that difference, I think, is crucially uh, important. Um, in France, if you're a friend, you are a friend of the family. In France, I know three and four generations of, of people. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm a member of my French friends um, family. In the United States, um, I know a, a single person in a, in a family. Maybe I, I know a spouse or a partner. Um, rarely would I know a, a grandparent or a grandchild. And um, there are times in, in, the, in the States where I, you know, I've never even been to a friend's house. Um, so the, the, there's a, a pretty big distinction there, I think. Also, in, in, in America, um, friendships are often um, um, situational. You know, we have work friends, we have walking the lake friends, we have book group friends. Um, we have friends based on, on the, the situations in, in which we know them. Um, in France, if you're a friend, you're a friend. Um, you're not a situational friend. You're a friend because of you. You have been seen, evaluated, accepted and um, basically certified that, you know, you are a friend and it has a feeling of exclusivity to it that doesn't really have the same feeling in, in, in the States. Um, in the US, I regularly check in with friends. Hey, how you doing? What's up? How you feeling? You know, what you thinking? Um, in France, friends don't check up on anybody. Um, there are long, long gaps that I find between communication that, uh, for me, used to American communication is, is unnerving. Um, I, you know, I, I, you don't get a response to an email. You don't get a response to a letter. You don't get a response to a phone call. People contact you not to check in. They contact you when they have something they want to say, tell, or ask. Um, there's, there's a purpose for the, for the um, uh, this, uh, conversation and the connection, not just a, a sort of an automatic checking in. Um, let's see, I have more friends in the United States than I, than I do in France, but visit uh, for visit, I spend more time with my French friends. Um, and I know more about their lives 
because I'm included in more of the more parts of their lives. Um, in, in France, uh, I'm more likely to ask people for help uh, and I'm more likely to offer help. Uh, in the United States, I'm reluctant to ask for help. And when I offer help, people are reluctant to accept it. Um, it people are, French friendships are a lot more dependent than American friendships. You know, we have this, this notion of do it yourself and individualism, and we don't like to ask for help. Um, and we don't like to accept help. But I find French relations are, are very, much, uh, very much more uh, dependent than my relations in, in uh, this country. Um, conversations in the US are frequently about work. Um, in France, I've known people 20 years, I haven't the slightest idea what they do. Uh, one, one day a friend of mine was visiting and, and we were walking around the yard at my house and um, he's pointing, you know, you, you really need to trim that bush and you really need to do something with this tree and, and, you know, do something over here with these flowers. And I'm thinking, the hell does he know? And of course, five years later, I find out he's a landscape architect. Um, so, yeah, it's just very different conversations. Um, my French friends are much more demonstrative than my American friends. Um, they, they tell me they miss me. They tell me they wish I was there. They, you know, they send me hugs and kisses and emails and, and, and letters. And, you know, I rarely get that from my friends. I mean, sometimes I don't get it from my family. You know, it's, 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 a, much, it's a much more demonstrative culture. In the U.S., my, my friends are professionals and artists, and um, they know each other because I bring them together. In France, my friends are professionals, craftsmen, workers, farmers, intellectuals, entrepreneurs, and I don't bring them together because I know they're gonna be uncomfortable. Um, partially it's a matter of class, which is still important in France, and partially it's a matter of their relationship is, is with me. And they don't know what their relationship is vis-a-vis -vis each other except from me. And it's an, it's an uncomfortable situation for them. As, as um, Adrian was talking about the rules, there are lots of social rules. And in a situation with a huge mix of people, people don't always know the rules and don't always know where they fit in. And um, it's hard. So I do, I do keep people yeah. separate. Very, um, very, very important. Um, uh, um, Mark, uh, are you wrapping up on that point? Uh, yeah, you, you jump right in, Linda. Okay, great, because we, uh, we, we have a packed schedule and I want to move to the next question if that's a good point for you to stop there. That's fine. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Mark. So, so much to think about there and the difference in friendships. Thank you so much. Sure. Our next question is for Janet. So the French have a reputation for being intellectual, perhaps more intellectual than Americans. Do you think this is true? And if so, why or why not? Um, thank you for uh, hosting this event, first of all. Um, it's great to be back um, talking about demystifying the French. Um, I think that, yes, I, well, it depends, it depends kind of on what you mean when you say intellectual. And I want to also say, even before answering, that whenever you answer questions like this, you risk, of course, stereotyping and general, overgeneralizing. So, uh, of course, it depends if, uh, on who you're talking about. But the question is about whether the culture is, is more intellectual. And I think that, that what is certainly true um, is that it seems to me that there is more kind of cultural support for and interest in the intellectual life in France than in, in the United States. Um, and there's all different kinds of ways that this plays out in, in, in French life. Um, I actually have a, a chapter in my book that's called The Importance of Being Interesting, um, in which I talk about some of, those, some of those things. A lot of it has to do with the intellectual life. So, and it's not just, um, I mean, the stereotype is, you know, you think about the French people sitting around in a cafe smoking their cigarettes and, you know, wearing their berets and having philosophical discussions, which is a stereotype and a cliche, but it's also kind of true <laughs> that there's a lot of that that goes on. There's a lot of people sitting in cafes enjoying talking about ideas 
and books and films and whatever, and doing it together in a kind of social environment. Um, and it's definitely more a part of French life than it is in the United States. Um, another thing I think that's true is that um, it's, it's sort of built into the culture to develop that interest in, in intellectual things um, from childhood. So it's not um, unusual to see French parents in a museum with their little kids, um, you know, looking at the composition of a painting and sort of discussing it with this, these kids. Um, there's a wonderful, one of the things I love to do in France, there's a wonderful, um, I don't know, it's not really programs, it's segments, radio segments that take place at various times during the week, um, during the day with French school children in sort of elementary school age. And they're given the opportunity to ask questions of scientists, uh, politicians, artists. And one, I once heard um, these children interviewing, um, Tom, I think his name was Thomas Pesquet, the astronaut who was just up in the space station. And so these kids are invited to think up questions to ask these people and the questions they ask are really sweet. <laughs> They're really smart and they are given really respectful, interesting, um, smart answers. Um, and it, it's so, you know, I think that's, it's really built into the whole culture and it, and you see, you know, walking around Paris, there's, there are, there's this kind of didactic impulse in France so that there's, um, it, in the metro, you, there might be panels that are explaining the history of something that happened in this in this station or whatever. Um, there's just really this love of learning and of 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 their own history that is really a part of French life. And so, yeah, I think it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Janet. Thank you. You raise a lot of important uh, concepts. I, I especially like the one about about being also being interesting. Yes. Uh, so our next question is for Harriet, the dedicated question for Harriet. We've, we've already talked about Harriet, how, and you'll want to take yourself off mute there. You grew up in Iowa, but you've lived in France now for, you know, basically your whole life, raised your children there with a French husband. So based on your life's experience, what do you think is the most important difference between family life in the United States and in France? Well, thank you, Linda. And first of all, thank you all for coming. I see there are a few people from Iowa, as a matter of fact. So <laughs> that's nice too. Um, it's always hard to say, you know, pick out one thing that is the greatest difference. But since we're talking about France, I must admit that one of the greatest differences I have uh, run across in France and from the very beginning revolves around, guess what, food. Uh, not just food, food, but the attitude towards food, the table, how you act at the table, who goes to the table, what's going on at the table, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I will uh, illustrate uh, this by sharing a few stories with you. Um, when I first arrived in France, we would go out to my husband's uh, parents' country home and we would uh, spend the weekend. Now, the weekend, uh, was comprised, composed of food. <laughs> what did we do when we walk, woke up in the morning? My mother-in-law would say, what are we going to eat for lunch? And I'm sitting there on radar and going, oh my goodness, are we talking about lunch already? Yes, we're talking about lunch. Yes, and we shopped for lunch and we cooked for lunch and we got to the table for lunch. And then lunch was over about two hours later or three. And then we got back to dinner and we shopped for dinner and we cooked for dinner and we had dinner and voila, and the whole weekend. And uh, you know, it's not like one weekend in a year like this, this is normal standard procedure. So I had to get used to that. But I'm gonna go back now a little bit uh, just after having said this uh, to tell you about my French husband when I took him to America and he's with my family, okay? And so uh, same deal, okay, families together and you know, lunchtime comes around and he's looking at his watch and he says, well, uh, what are we doing you know, for lunch? And I said, well, Philippe, as you can see, we're not doing anything. And he said, yeah, but I'm hungry and I wanna eat. You know, like normal people eat at, at noontime or, you know, sometime, one o'clock. 
And I said, I know normal people do. I mean, French people do, but my family is American. And as you see, nothing's happening uh, because, uh, you know, one guy's going to go have pizza. Another one's going to say, I'm not hungry, blah, 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 you know, very individual. So Philippe says, okay, they can do what they want, but I'm hungry, I'm eating. So he goes out, he buys all this food, comes back home, he cooks it. And guess who was at the table? All my family, it smelled so good and it looked so good. And so they were so happy to sit down and we had a French lunch. <laughs> and guess who became the French chef? But the point of the anecdote is that was exceptional because they went right back to being their individual selves because in America, as Mark so rightly said, it's all about being individuals and doing what you want when you want. And there is not group uh, think. Okay. So anyway, they learn about this when they're very small. And when our uh, son was two years old, okay, you'll say it's a long time ago, but things haven't changed that much. Mm -hmm. When he was two years old, I'm out there in the country and we're sitting at the table <clears throat> and he's being the way a two-year-old can be, that's to say, silly and you know kind of <laughs> fidgety and stuff and he said something and I thought it was cute but don't you always think your kids are cute I mean you know and so uh my in-laws didn't think he was cute at all and I got the disapproving look which is was very unusual because they're very open tolerant uh wonderful people but this was the first time I'd ever seen the look <gasps> and I said oh my goodness I think we just did transgress something here so I kind of cooled it. And then I decided when in Rome, when in France, and he got with the program. And the kid learned as all French children do that they can be at the table with adults. They can sit at that table for the meal. They will eat what the adults eat. They will not be the center of attention. And life is happy. Everybody's happy. Adults are happy. Kids are happy. I wish I had a picture of my seven-year-old granddaughter eating oysters, seven to nine oysters on the half shell at Christmas Eve. And that's par for the course. Okay. So they learn, they, they learn that it's a good thing to be convivial. It's a good thing to be at the table, but that there are rules. And actually, Adrian, you talked about, you know, you should have expectations. And not have expectations, but have hope. Well, you were talking about something else, but I can assure you that at the French family table for kids, you've got expectations and there's no hope they're gonna be good. They're gonna be good. <laughs> so that was one big difference. Um, and uh, it, it, they learned the lesson so well that my aunt came from America and we had another family meal and everybody's around it and laughing, talking, having a good time. And at the end of the meal, she came to me and she said, Harriet, she said, I got to ask you a question. And I said, well, sure, what? She said, are your children all right? And I said, well, yeah, they're fine, why? And she said, because they didn't say a word during the meal. <laughs> and I said, well, that's the way they were brought up. And I said, and of course they were on their best behavior and they let it rip when they're with their father and me, but they have learned that they are not the center of attention and it's not about them. So. All of this is kind of a thing, I'm talking about individuals and about group kind of thing. Um, so my kids are half French and half American, and they have uh, both of the good uh, parts of, of each, which is very nice. But I would say that this is a huge cultural difference. This thank whole you. expectation of you know, what thank, you want. Thank you, Harriet, that was great. Love those anecdotes, thank you so much. Now we're going to move to our next uh, section, which is where each of the panelists will give their points of view on an overarching question. We'll start off with Janet for this one. So Janet, what do you think is the biggest or perhaps the most damaging misconception that Americans have about the French um, and then vice versa that the French have about the Americans? Um, well, I think actually they, the most, um, the at least the saddest and, and really kind of damaging um, misconception that both Americans have about the French and the French have about Americans is kind of the same thing, which is that they think each other are rude. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I deal with students in a study abroad program every summer when there's not COVID and, um, I, I usually ask them, you know, in their orientation, what, what what people have told them about, you know, France before they come, and 
I, I'm telling you, there's there's this there's this myth out there that the French are, in quotes, rude, arrogant, and they hate Americans. This is what they're told. And so, and the reason I ask them what they're told is because I want to be able to start disabusing them of this notion and say, no, it's not true. Um, but what, it, what happens is there are these really basic rules of etiquette. This is a large part of the reason why I wrote my book um, is to have a really quick, easy um, kind of manual to let Americans know what is expected in social interactions. Um, because it's different in France than uh, in the United States. It's much more formulaic. You're supposed to say, you're supposed to not say one word to another person before you say bonjour, preferably bonjour madame or bonjour monsieur. And it's rigid. I mean, if you don't do that, you're skipping a really, really important thing. But Americans don't know that necessarily. And so when they go into a shop, and just say, you know, and smile or whatever, um, and, and, you know, start saying what they want because Americans are very direct. They're always going right to the business at hand. Um, then sometimes I think they get sort of a frosty reception because the French are reeling back thinking, my goodness, they're so rude. They didn't even say bonjour. Um, and so, so the French are thinking <laughs> that the Americans are rude because they don't, they don't know these basic rules. And the Americans can't figure out why they're not being received very well. So I think it's the same thing. They think each other are rude. And, they, you know, it's not true of either of them. It, the, the, the Americans are ignorant of some really important rules of etiquette. Um, and pretty simple, actually. Um, and the French are just kind of shocked at our rude behavior. So it's really too bad when that happens, because if, 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 you can just know those rules and start out with them. Everything goes better from the get-go. Okay, thank you, Janet. The, so continuing with our uh, the same question for all the panelists on the biggest or past, uh, perhaps most damaging misconception <clears throat> Americans have about the French and vice versa. Let's go to um, Adrian for that one. Well, I actually completely agree with uh, Janet on the idea that they think each other is rude, but I'd like to add a couple of things because I think Americans tend to see the French as arrogant and unfriendly, you know, which I think is a big misconception. Um, and on the other side, I think the French think that Americans are adolescent, silly and stupid, <laughs> you know, and there's actually some truth to both aspects of these um, conceptions or misconceptions uh, because Americans, we are adolescent. We are in an adolescent uh, civilization uh, compared to the French who have many centuries, right? Of uh, tradition and history. And we are in some ways adolescent. And of course we have these fabulously smiling faces because we're happy and open-minded. And, and so we sort of look to them silly and stupid while they are not filled with all of you know their their happy eyes and smiles and so we think they're unfriendly and so yes but the bo i i completely agree with janet that the bottom line is that we think each other is rude for different reasons and again it's really just we don't understand one another that's <laughs> absolutely that's, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you, Adrian. And let's go to Mark for the same question. Uh, the biggest and most damaging misconceptions in both directions. And Mark, you want to take yourself off mute, okay? You'd think I could remember this, right? Um, anyhow, um, there's not much to add really to, to what Janet and Adrian said. Yes, you know, rudeness for sure. Um, Arrogance. I do have a couple of others that that are less prominent, but but also um, consistent. Uh, Americans tend to think that um, uh, French people are lascivious. You know, all that touching, all that public affection, um, nudity on the beaches, French movies. You know, when I was a kid, everybody wanted French postcards. Um, you know, so they, you have this sense of hypersexuality. Um, and in, in, in France, you know, um, uh, 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 in terms of stereotypes, you know, maybe um, women sort of dream of, of, uh, of Italian and, and Spanish men. Well, 
you know, men dream of, of French women. Um, there's this, 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 there's this lasciviousness um, that feels very, very prominent. Um, Mark, we could do a whole webinar just on that subject alone. Yeah, <laughs> we could. But I'm not talking. <laughs> um, on, on the other end, um, I think yeah, French people think uh, Americans are, are pretty naive, pretty superficial. Um, we're always happy. We're always optimistic. You know, uh, my, my, my friends in, in France always make fun of me whenever I say wonderful. Like, oh, we wonderful, wonderful. Um, you know, because that's the language I use. It's not the language they use. You know, the most extreme you get out of them is, is, is a bon. Everything is bon. You know, for me, everything is wonderful. For them, everything is bon. Um, it, it, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge difference. Um, they also think that Americans are overly interested in money, you know, interested in price, cost, money. And they, of course, are also interested in money, but they don't want to talk about money. Uh, and they're more interested in what money can buy rather than in money itself. Um, and um, so there aren't a lot of a lot of conversations um, about about money. So th those are the, the the differences after the arrogance and rude and and negativity and uh, that sort of thing. Um, one other story. Um, they also think Americans are fat. So I, ha I had um, a neighbor of mine was, I was talking to a neighbor of mine in front of my house and a friend of mine, an American friend was visiting and he had actually come downstairs from the bedroom and was putting on his t-shirt while he was standing in the doorway. And my French neighbor looks at him and goes, ah, un American typique. Um, so he was very clear that Americans look differently than French people. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Some some difficult stereotypes to deal with here. Um, Harriet, if you'll take yourself off mute, we'll catch you for the final answer to the question of the your perception of the most damaging misconceptions um, in both directions. Well, uh, I guess I have very little to add since you've all said it. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that we're all saying the same thing because my, I was uh, in my notes, I put, well, Americans um, think that the French are rude, arrogant, haughty, and cold. And um, I, I read that to my husband, my French husband, and he said, no, they're not cold, they're cautious. And, uh, Never forget that France is a country that's been invaded three times. You don't know who your enemy is. You don't feel like being instantly friendly with just anybody walking down the street. That's very different. America's never been invaded. So I think that, you know, that kind of sums that up. Um, and Paris is not France. So people come to Paris and they get one rude waiter and a Parisians in any case are a whole different bag of people, uh, but you, they go to the provinces and, oh, it's different. So, you know, we have got to keep that in mind too. As for the French about Americans, um, I was very shocked the first time I heard that expression, les grands enfants. And I said, what? What is that all about? But it's just exactly what Adrian was saying, that they think we are um, very naive, very naive. And, um, uh, and they do think another thing about the friendships, they think that American friendships are superficial uh, because we're, as uh, Mark said, it, it, American friendships are situational. And that's not the way it works in France. So they think that we're just, you know, totally superficial on that count. But um, actually French friends, you have them for life and it's a whole different thing. And I'm just gonna very quickly add one anecdote about, um, uh, being friends and about the class structure, we had friends coming to visit us in a small village where we live and they, they stayed at a b and And lo and behold, they went down to breakfast in the morning and we found them chatting with the, uh, the owner of the place, the land, landlady or whatever you call her. And my husband was horrified. He said, what, why are they talking that way to her? She's, she's running a business, you know? And I said, oh yeah, they're best friends now, you know? <laughs> And he was really, because for him, each person has a place 
and they weren't respecting the place of that person, right. that place in society of that person. The person was not freaked out at all. It wasn't a problem, but it was a total cultural difference. Voila, that's all I have to say on that subject. <laughs> wow, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Harriet, and everyone for your answers to that overarching question. Now we're going to go to part uh, two of our, our presentation today. And that is where we have a set of uh, roughly a dozen questions that the, that the panelists will answer um, freestyle and, and so forth. So the first one uh, is about, uh, it goes as follows. And these are questions from you, the audience that you submitted um, with your, with your registrations. I love the first one. My French husband wanted to know why you want to demystify the French. Uh, Janet, can you start us off there? Yes. Um, I mean, I am the one who wrote, wrote the book with that title. And um, I think, you know, the reason I, well, a lot of the reason I wrote the book is, as I said, because I really wanted to give Americans um, the information they need to know what's expected um, to be polite in France and therefore to have a better time and also to not shock every person, French person they come across. Um, so that's a lot of the reason. Um, and I, I think though the book is really aimed mainly at Americans or at least at non-French people, um, non-French uh, Anglophones. Um, I also kind of was, was hopeful that for the French people who would read it, um, much smaller audience there, but for if, I, I hoped that if French people would read it, it, they would also understand Americans better. They would understand some of the things that we've just been talking about um, from having read my book. And I've been very pleased. Um, I haven't talked to a lot of French people who have read it, but the few that I have, have in fact said that yes, they, they understood things better about Americans and, and the way they are. Um, so that was sort of a fringe benefit. But I mean, the other reason is that it's fun. <laughs> it's fun trying to you know understand each other and realize what all these differences are. I have an epigraph in, in the um, beginning of my book. It's a quote from Henry James, who, you know, was this 19th century American writer who spent lots of time thinking about cultural differences between um, Americans and Europeans in general, and also um, the French. And he, I came across somewhere a quote, he said, um, compare then I say, as often as the occasion presents itself, the process is both instructive and entertaining. And I think it is, I think you can learn from it. And I think it's also just plain fun. Janet, I have a question for you, though. Do you think the French are as curious about us as we are about them? Or are we just so open book and obvious that they that we they don't need to demystify us? I don't know. That's an interesting question. I mean, I think that um, probably they aren't as interested in that. And, and actually, I have had people I've had people say um, express the reservation that my book, the title of my book even, would be um, insulting to French people. Um, but mostly, it I, I've never encountered any French person to say, you know, you know, why do you want to, well, well this question is, is about why did I do it, but I don't get the sense that it's a um, hostile question. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, they find it interesting. They find it interesting that we want to um, demystify them and they're interested in what would be so mysterious about them. Um, and yeah, I think probably they don't wonder as much about us because, <laughs> because we're not, you know. We're, we're, we're not we're, mysterious. Yeah, we're not, we're not the same. You know, anyway. I, saw, I saw the answer to this question. Uh, I perceived it as being much simpler that the French person would not want to be demystified because then that risks making them less interesting. <laughs> Well, there's that too. In fact, I, I thought about, I, I should have really um, said that because I, I, it, it depends on what the sense of the question is. I mean, there is this, um, there is this appeal of the, of the um, mysterious. Um, and, and so it depends on what the French husband was wondering precisely. But um, anyway, it, it's all interesting. 
Yeah, I read I read your book and came up with that as an as an immediate reaction, having read that I think in your book. So um, uh, maybe we could move on to question number two because we're going to try to make through make it through these ten questions in in I think twenty minutes. So our next question is from the audience: Is what advice would you give a first time traveler to friends? What are the most important values, for example, that the French appreciate and expect from travelers? And Mark, can you start us off on that one? Sure. I think all you have to do is remember what your grandmother taught you. You know, you say. <laughs> You say thank you, please, um, hello, goodbye. You're polite. Politeness is is extremely uh, important in France. You speak as much French as you can. You try to speak French. You try to follow the rules, whether or not you know them. Um, if you're smart, I think you'll be deferential. Um, you'll certainly be appreciative of of what you see, and definitely you ought to pay attention to your appearance and how you look. Um, no casual Friday at uh, certain events. Um, it, it's, it's, it's very important to um, maintain comportment. Um, and, and again, everything grandma told you was right. Okay, thanks, Mark. How about the rest of you? Thoughts on this uh, topic for first time travelers? I'm sorry? Oh, how about the rest of you? Thoughts for first time travelers? Harriet, you wanna? Take yourself off mute. There you go. Muted. No, I, I just agree. Um, I think that if, uh, you know, you don't have to be worried if you don't speak any French, but if you can speak at least a few words of French just to say merci, bonjour, or anything just to show that you're interested, that's important. As Mark said, politesse is very important in France. And uh, anything you can do that shows that you're a polite person uh, is important. Um, so, don't do that thing of rushing up to somebody and just asking a question. You know? No, and let's remember to say, s'il vous plaît, right. mm -hmm. constantly, constantly. <laughs> yeah, and then I'll just mention here that uh, a little plug for the Alliance, that there are different, uh, what they call in French, registre de langue. You will actually compose a question differently. Uh, there's formal ways to compose the questions and there's uh, compose questions and less formal. And, and that's one of the things we cover with our, with our Alliance Française students. So very helpful for tourists there. So let's move on. Thank you, panelists. Let's move on to our next question, which I love. It's how do you recommend that visitors to Paris experience the real Paris, not as a tourist, um, but for a more local or more authentic experience? Adrian, you want to start us off on that one? Well, sure. I mean, for me, it starts with uh, rather than staying in a hotel where you will definitely feel like a visitor that you stay in an apartment if you can. You rent a you know, furnished apartment so that you can actually feel like you are one of them. You go to the market, you buy some food for your breakfast or lunch and um, become a part of that neighborhood and, you know, mm -hmm. visit other merchants, uh, visit the cafes rather than see yourself as just a temporary visitor. I mean, I think it comes from within, not from without. So it's by placing yourself in a situation where you are a resident, even if you're that resident for only a few days. Yeah. I always tell people um, that if even if you don't have very much time in Paris, perhaps especially if you don't have very much time in Paris, I think it's important to leave some time to just be there. <laughs> Walk, mm -hmm. sit in a garden or in a cafe, do what the French do. They, they go to a cafe, they have a glass of wine or a cup of coffee, they take out their books and read, they you know, or write in their journals, whatever. Um, and so I think, I mean, to me, that is the most wonderful thing about it, being in Paris is to be able to do that, to be in a, a public place surrounded by people and, and just in your own private space at the same time, but be, to be surrounded by people. And my students always notice this, that the, the cafe um, table, the chairs in the cafes on the, on the terrace, are all facing outward uh, and they always notice this. And so it's about, you know, just sitting in a cafe and whiling away the time and watching the world go by. I think that- yeah. And Janet, this is not just about Paris. This is yes. about anywhere in France. Right, that's true. Good point, yep. 
Yeah, because, you know, we tend to get Paris centric, but there is there is a lot of other country and um, living not in your bubble, live communing is really part of it. And just, yeah, being out, sitting among the the other, you know, French, Parisians, whatever, and um, taking just soaking it in and not running from the museum, you know, from one museum to another and just experiencing life as it is. Agree. Right. I would agree with that too. Oh, huh. I'm on mute. Am I on mute? No, no you're good. You're good. You're good, Harriet. You're good. No, I would absolutely agree with that. That was what I would have said too. I would say that while they're sitting in the local cafe, uh, that cafe doesn't need to be near the Eiffel Tower. You can go to a city and once you've hit the, the high spots, you can walk off into some unknown neighborhood. Paris is a safe city and you can you will discover things that you would never have imagined. And so I would encourage people to get off the beaten path if they can. That's a luxury maybe, but something you can do. Good transportation system, you can walk. I have one reverse culture shock that I had coming to California. The first night I went to dinner with my daughter and sat at a table that was twice the size of an average French table. And I felt so removed from her. And I said, you're too far away. I can't, we can't be intimate. I have to yell across the table. And I really experienced this, uh, you know, this acute difference of how we communicate with one another on a regular basis in France compared to the U S and she says, but we have so much more space to put all of our food. And I said, so what? I mean, you know, we can't feel like we're together. Exactly. It was very strange for me. Great. So I think, uh, thank you all for your answers to that question. Uh, let's move to our next one. We have, uh, this is the question. As a guest at, our, at a dinner party in, in a French home, I am hyper aware of the expectation or hope that I will be interesting or amusingly provocative. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, Harriet? Oh, my thoughts on this are uh, brief. <laughs> Having been a, a guest at many, many, many French dinner parties, I would say to that person, just be yourself. Because as an American, you don't have to do anything to be interesting or provocative. You already are. <laughs> <laughs> every time I open my mouth, I speak fluent French, but I can assure you every time I open my mouth with my French, my American accent, which I retained because I never got the U's and the R's perfect, uh, people just, it's just like, they can't believe that I'm real. <laughs> the person doesn't have to do anything, you know? She's American, you know? This is just wonderful. <laughs> the other day in the store, I, there's this vigil, this guard, you know? And I went, walked up to him and I asked him a question and he looked at me and he just stared at me. And I said, good Lord, what I do wrong? And he stared at me, he said, your accent. He says, where are you from? And that day I decided to lie. And he said, oh, you're, you're English? And I said, yes, yes, I'm English. And he was very happy with that. And I walked off. But the point <laughs> is that if you've got an accent, you, you are already just so interesting and so different. And if you've been here as long as I have, you end up lying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is a wonderful, wonderful answer. Uh, if uh, any of the other panelists have questions, uh, have points to make on that one, if not, then we'll move on to the next one. We've got so many good questions here. I would, the next one is, is I would be interested in knowing how French people are for neighbors and how they might differ from Americans. Uh, for example, can I knock on someone's door and borrow a cup of sugar? Mark, can you lead us off on that one? Sure. I mean, one of the surprising things for me was um, uh, there is not a rule about being a good neighbor. Um, I've had neighbors who uh, lived next door to me for years who I've never spoken to. And I've had neighbors next to me who uh, I know quite well and we've become um, friends and I feel like a member of the family. One of my neighbors, um, uh, the first uh, contact with him was, and this was within a month of after I, I uh, bought the house and was there, it came over and knocked on the door and proceeded to tell me that he had the right to have me cut my trees down. Um, and uh, he was very aware of his rights. And I think French people are very aware of their rights. And he had no compunction about telling me 
what what I was required to do, what he had the authority to do. And he wasn't going to sugarcoat anything for me. He wasn't going to um, sort of soften it and, and, and sort of ease into the topic. Um, he knocked on the door for a reason and he explained what he wanted. And it was all, you know, very clear. One time I came, this was the first summer I was there. Uh, one time I came and um, there was a, a yellow marker all across my trees at six foot height. These were 30 foot tall cypress trees, um, a whole row of about 40 of them. And he had a long line of, of fluorescent yellow paint along the, the tree trunks at six feet height, basically telling me this is, this is what's gonna happen. Um, and again, he had, he, he wasn't going to ease me into anything. You know, here in the States, if you're going to do something that affects your neighbor, you sort of try to get them on your side. You sort of warm them up to the topic. You try not to make an enemy with them. Didn't matter there at all. He had the right to do it. And if he pulled the, the, uh, the plug, he was going to do it. As it is, we worked something out, which I wrote about in my, in, in my first book. I, I I became I became a New Yorker from my California days and um, threatened him in, in in a way he couldn't refuse to accept. So um, uh, I kept I, I kept I most something? of the trees. Can I can I add something? Sure. Um, Sidonie, I'm a Parisian, and um, I love Mark's book. He knows that. Um, I want to say that concerning the neighbors, it's two different things, whether you're in Paris or the rest of France, that's one thing. I've always lived in Paris and I've never known my neighbors beyond bonjour, you know, <coughs> that's usually the only thing, the only exchange we had, but it got to a point that people get so fed up with that, that they started doing a, a, a community Fest, which is called, uh, you know, La Fête des Voisins, which means that <coughs> in your building, you're supposed to meet everyone, maybe in the courtyard or in the, on the sidewalk if there's no courtyard, and you're supposed to interact with every floor, every neighbors that you've never met, that sometimes you've never even seen, and talk it through. And this has worked wonderful for a lot of people, especially in Paris. I'm sure this was done all over France, but I don't have the experience of the rest. Because in Paris, everybody lives in the building, right? So that's, um, you know, it's different if you live in a house in Brittany and you're, you know, isolated or whatever. You have to actually walk to your neighbor and make the effort. But in Paris, in your building, you would think, you would assume it's nice to know everybody from top to bottom. And then it came out wonderful things from that. And then there was the street voisin. So people would, you know, have a big banquet and take the whole street, the whole block in the summer, in June, and have a dinner, a community dinner. And everybody was so, it was so helpful. And I don't know why nobody has thought of that before. This is only in the last 10 or 12 years, I would say, and it's working wonderful. And now it's very easy to go ask for that cup of sugar or to ask. I've had people say, oh, can you take my dog for the day? Because I'm going away for the day. So any kind of things that would never have happened. But this is almost, it almost took, I'm not going to say a government intervention because that's too much, but it took an effort of someone, I don't even know who started that it, idea. It, it was a government intervention. <laughs> was it? We, uh, we had a fete voisin in my building almost about 20 years ago. I made a big bowl of fried chicken wings. <laughs> the French didn't know what to do with that at all. It was absolutely hilarious and we had a blast. Okay, it was so much fun. But that was the first and last time, hasn't happened since. Haven't said more than bonjour, madame, bonjour, monsieur, to anyone ever since. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. And yeah. you know what, Adrian and Sidonie, thank you, uh, Sidonie, for that uh, uh, 
comment. We're going to move because we just have barely enough time to finish two other questions before we open it up for Emily and Paris that we're all waiting for. So let's go ahead and uh, tackle a question with Janet, which is how easy is it for a willing American? And this is kind of related to the previous question. How easy is it for a willing American to become integrated into a French community? Janet, why don't you start us off? Thank you. Yeah, well, I don't think it's all that easy <laughs> for many of the reasons that have been discussed um, already, but um, it, it's certainly possible. And I, I, I think one of the ways that, um, I mean, how do you do that? So, so I think one of the ways is you find activities um, that you enjoy doing um, and, and, and that there are, are ways to do with others in your community. I live in a small French village and in this village has a very active hiking club, for example. And they have all these, these high, frequent hikes. And so that for me is a really good way because I love walking um, to, to get to know more people than I would otherwise just in my daily you know, going around. Um, of course, most communities, whether, whether urban or rural, have um, opportunities for volunteer help, you know, volunteering for things. Um, and that's a good way, I think, that there's a community garden here. I am not a gardener, <laughs> so I haven't been, been doing that, but uh, I think you can find ways to be helpful in the community and it's always appreciated. And um, that's another good way to get to know people in, in a natural way. Yeah, Janet, think. do you think it's easier to do in the village than it is in the city? Well, I don't know, because I haven't really lived in Paris. I imagine it is. Well, I don't know, actually. I don't think so. I think that it's the same thing. You, fi you find um, places where people that share your interests mm -hmm. um, are congregating. And, and um, because villages can be, you know, <laughs> villages can be pretty, you know, there's all kinds of... Uh, uh, both positive and negative aspects to living in a village. And so I, I think it's not really that it's better in, in a village than in the city. I think it's just different. Um, but, the but the basic principle of finding people who, who you know, are interested in the same things you are and, and then in volunteering your help for various things is the same. I, yeah, I, think. Th I think that, um, you know, you can, you can feel accepted and be accepted and, um, be welcome and be very, very, <clears throat> excuse me, and very, very comfortable. But you will always be the American. Yeah, um, always. And, and you, you and they will always recognize you as the American. Um, I mean, I've been in my village 30, 30 years. And, um, uh, you know, when people want to give directions, it's, uh, well, you go back to the Americans. Um, yes. <laughs> or you know, it's that's that's the reference point. And Absolutely. I mean, I know people who have been of Spanish descent who have been in France for generations, and they're still identifiable as as Spanish. And 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 of course, God knows what happens if, if you're you know Muslim, Arab, you know black or whatever. I mean, those people have been there generations, and and trying to integrate is almost impossible. Any, any great, thank you. Any other comments on that question? If, if not, then we probably have time for one more question before we turn it over to Emily and Paris. Uh, um, very um, thought provoking topics there, Mark. So our last question is, what if anything has changed since say the 80s or 90s, other than the French uh, now wearing baseball hats and sneakers, which were typically how you would identify Americans when, when some of us lived there in the past. Um, Adrian, why don't you start it up the, the, probably the biggest changes that you've perceived that we should be aware of um, since the 80s or 90s? Oh, I think the number one biggest change is the, the French all speak English now. They're teaching kids how to speak English from a very early age. And so they're growing up speaking English and uh, that has opened up everything culturally and otherwise. Uh, so sure, we see, I mean, the internet has been a major influence on, on, on opening the French to a more global viewpoint. 
and a lot of Americanism, but the fact that they're all at least bilingual and trilingual, I think has made a huge difference in our ability to communicate with each other. And I see that as our, our, our number one biggest change in the last few years. And not only are they speaking uh, English uh, uh, more, but they're actually you know, willing and wanting to, to speak English. You know, it used to be when I spoke my, my miserable French, people would occasionally um, help me out and, and break into English. Um, now people will start talking English almost, almost immediately. I mean, people want to, want to speak English, want to practice their English. Um, and, and it is quite, quite helpful. Um, the other thing is they're much more um, used to seeing strangers different kinds of people, um, especially in the rural areas. You know, when I, when I first moved um, to, to the house in Brittany in the early 90s, uh, my wife, who's Japanese American, would come to the village and people would literally walk up to her and touch her hair and say, what are you? Um, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, we had one sort of Asian restaurant in the area. And those were the only Asian people, you know, you, you saw. And they weren't certainly integrated into the community. Um, so, yeah, you know, and that hasn't happened for decades right, in terms of people walking up and wondering what you are, because more strange looking people are, are coming through. And, and, and especially around my house, a lot of strange people are coming through. So people are getting used to strangeness, at least in my village. <laughs> I would uh, agree with that very much. I think the French have also become much more informal. Maybe is that the internet? Is that you know international culture kind of thing? But it's like a casual Friday. It seems like people in France do casual Friday even when they go to the the opera. I mean, they used to get dressed up to go to the opera, and now there you see people in horrible attire and jeans and sweatshirts and. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is hamburgers all over the place. I remember when I first came to France, um, there were no hamburger buns at the supermarket. Nobody knew what a hamburger was. I had to assemble it and I, I threw a party and nobody knew what to do. So I had to explain how to eat this thing. Not and anymore. Anymore. I mean, and the French have really got off on this. I mean, boy, every kind of hamburger you want, sophisticated hamburgers, ordinary hamburger, whatever. Anyway, Harriet, one out of every two sandwiches uh, sold in France is a hamburger. I'm not surprised. And uh, also, um, one thing you see that is really uh, has changed from the 90s is that people now are uh, the, the meals are destructured. Remember how I told you in the country we eat twice a day regular meals. Uh, this still goes on in many families, but you see people at all time uh, times of the day now, like you do in the states. You know, sometimes my husband would uh, say to me, at, uh, "We walk down the street in France, and it's four o'clock," and he said, "Well, what meal are they on?" <laughs> 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 I said, oh. but uh now you know you do see french people eating nachos at you know okay still the or de peratif but you know uh this is something you didn't see before so destructured meals and uh everything's less formal and a, a lot of things have changed in france and i'll just one last comment uh there's a lot of uh the, the really chic thing for a French person to do is to put English words into his French, his or her French. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, so, you, can't, you can't hardly listen to a speech by Macron without every other word is le marketing, le business, uh, etc. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you all of you for your answers to that question and to all the questions. And uh, someone in the chat suggested that we, we want to thank you. <laughs> and I do want to thank you for all of the insights that you provided. And that was from somebody who has been living in France for five years now. And that person has learned a lot from the discussion and the insights that you all have shared. We can move on now to Emily in Paris. And um, I think the question that we, <laughs> what we got from, a, from one of the uh, audience is, uh, I couldn't get more than a few minutes into Emily in Paris before I got mad about how inaccurate it was. What do you think the show got right about Paris or French culture? Harriet, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I, 
I must admit, when I started watching Emily, that I was just dumbfounded, especially by uh, Emily's clothes, <laughs> which are so, I mean, I just couldn't imagine anybody wearing that to an office, but that's okay. Um, Except maybe me, Harriet. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> 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 no, I thought they got right was the French boss, Sylvie. I mean, she is the French woman to a T. She's so, she's so snarky. She's funny. She knows her place. And she really puts Emily in her place. And um, I, I just love this scene where Emily discovers that Sylvie is married, primo, and Duxio she is married to the man that Emily has just described to her as being a dirt bag. <laughs> <laughs> and Emily is absolutely horrified. But at the same time, she's, she's astonished because how could Sylvie not have told her that she was married? I mean, she should know that. No, no. And Sylvie says, no. Sylvie is like many French women, most French women, I could say, but that's a generalization. But she uh, is uh, world weary in a way and sophisticated and she wants to keep her private life private. And, and she's almost offended by Emily's open, trusting, uh, smiley face. This is, is almost offends her. And I thought that that was hysterical. I thought they got that one really hit the nail on the head with that. So. Adrian, how about you uh, on Emily in Paris? I know you've got some strong opinions. Oh, I do. I have very strong opinions because um, I think when I watched episode two, where she's on the Orient Express, okay, which is, of course, doesn't come into uh, the Riviera, and she she's en route to Saint-Tropez via Villefranche, which is 119 kilometers away and not anywhere near it. I was screaming at the TV because then she checks into a hotel in Cap Ferrat, but she's supposed to be in Saint-Tropez. And I, and I just thought, okay, Darren Starr, do you think we are such idiots that we don't know where, you know, geographically where these cities <laughs> exist? And how that was just so insulting, I couldn't stand it. But further down, you know, for later in later episodes, the Chicago boss comes to visit the agency, and all she cares about is how much money they're making out of each client. Yet the French agency only cares about the relationships. And that's when I thought, you know what? They got it right. They, uh, they, they understood that there's more to life in France than making money. And that difference in our cultural aspects was, I thought they got that really right. So, okay, they redeemed themselves <laughs> further down in the show. But um, I also agree with Harriet that the wardrobe was completely and absolutely not just ridiculous from every level and that it, maybe it was fun to look at, but not in context. <laughs> I think a lot of us Americans enjoyed watching Emily in Paris, even though there were some things we didn't agree with it, just because of the beautiful filmography uh, around Paris and then also Villefranche and so forth. I, 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 oh, the I scenery. Really yeah, the scenery, the scenery. Exactly. It was just, yeah. it was just, you know, it, it was a little bit maybe stereotypical because it was real, even though it was, you know, for the show, um, it was, it was, it was for some of us like going home again, if we haven't been to Paris in a while, which because of the pandemic, many, many of us have not been. Um, Janet and Mark, how about your reactions to Emily in Paris? What did, what did, what did the show get right? Well, I would agree that the the thing that I thought they got the most right, it was the same episodes in which um, Emily's boss from Chicago comes to, to and I agree with everything Adrian said, but there in particular, <clears throat> there's a, <laughs> there's a um, social event of the, of the office, of the agency. And this boss, this American boss wants to confront um, the, 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 you know, the, the people about this financial issue at this party. And, and they tell her very politely, but also 
very, very clearly, we don't talk about this kind of thing when we're socializing. That's right. And, and she just goes right ahead. <clears throat> and she says, but this isn't a social event. It's a business event. And so she just kind of thinks, you know, she's the boss and she's right and she's going to get her way. And it completely backfires um, because she because she's functioning in a different world and she's not respecting how it works at all. So, yeah, I thought that that was right. That was on. a great scene, Janet. I agree with you completely. Out of place. And there was this whole thing about the French not working on weekends because uh, Emily wants to, you know, keep keep working, going through this project kind of thing. And uh, they said, we don't we don't work. On weekend, it's a weekend, you know, loosen up, have a good time. Uh, so it was this whole thing about the work ethic kind of thing. And so I saw a question there in the chat said, do the French work on weekends? No. French people, I <laughs> not very much. Oh, no, in fact, do you know that there are regulations about answering work emails on off hours? that an employee is not required to actually answer work-related emails when they are not at work. And so this is, it's regulated by the government. It's part of the rules. Yeah. I think it's You're called also, the right to disconnect or something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, and you yeah. also have the right to eat. You didn't used to have the right to eat at your desk. <laughs> Until the pandemic, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, there is a rule that says you don't eat at your desk. I mean, you have to go out or, or you have the, the boss has to provide a place for you to work like at a canteen in, inside the maybe the building, but you don't eat at your desk. And this goes back to the rules, the rules that you yes. have to follow. Yes, yes. <laughs> Social hygiene. <laughs> yeah, Adrian, that's a good point. We've kind of come full circle back to some of our uh, original or opening discussions and and I think with that, I, I, I think we can wrap up the program today, as the French would say, on a ad, admirablement dans les temps. Um, and I'd like to thank all of our panelists so much for sharing your insights. I don't know if you've had a chance to take a look at the chat, but it's been, uh, there is a, a lot of wonderful commentary on there. There's great suggestions on shows to watch in French. The audience are sharing with one another. Um, a very wonderful audience, very active. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, we hope to see you at another event very soon and um, have a wonderful day. Merci and thank you, Linda and Melissa. Bye.